Hey guys, so six months of studying are over. Thank God the European Board of Ophthalmology exam has been passed. I just got word yesterday. I shared it on Instagram and on Facebook and thank you guys a lot for your wishes and uh, very, very sweet words. I truly appreciate it. And thank you guys for being along this journey. It was definitely a lot of, um, a lot of just improvising because I didn't really find good material out there in the beginning to help me as a roadmap on what to study or how to study for this exam. So I'm gonna, in summary, just share with you what I studied, what resources I used during these six months. And as well, I have a lot of videos that are showing this journey. You can definitely check them on the channel. And then how the exam looked like. And um, yeah, what are my thoughts on it toward the end? So let's start with the beginning. How I prepared for this exam. So um, I signed up for the European Board around the month of October and the exam was on May 12, 2023. Um, I knew that I had a short period of time to prepare for everything because the European Board of Ophthalmology mainly recommends that you study from the American Board of Ophthalmology books or the American Academy of Ophthalmology books, the AAO books. Now, um, these books, there are 13 books, 12 excluding general medicine they are the bible of our of our of our creed they're the source of all our knowledge it is really a shame and i i do regret this that i didn't start with the american academy books from day one of residency in europe um it's more of a recommended like we're pushed forth towards kansky towards the oxford handbook towards some other resources which are good but compared to the American Academy books, these are a brochure. I'm not, I'm not exaggerating. The, the American Academy books are basically um, like the, the infrastructure of ophthalmology. You understand why we give the medicine we give, the main studies that were done for it. What is the, what does the future look like? Um, how everything interconnects and relates to one another. When you finish even one of these books, you feel like saturated, you feel happy, you feel um, more self-confident in your clinic and in your work and in your knowledge, and it becomes addictive. You wanna understand and learn more and read more and see what's in the, in the other books. So uh, when I started reviewing the Academy books, I, it was around October, I realized it's gonna be a huge, a huge feat. And I knew that I was not gonna have enough time to read throughout all these books because each book is roughly about five, 600 pages, and I was working full time. So um, the books that I covered or had enough time to cover were cornea, retina, pediatrics, neuro, and uh, pathology and optics. And uh, uh, the rest of the books, I had to skim quickly through them, but um, I, I didn't really delve as deep into them as, as I wanted to uh, by the time that everything was done. So I reviewed the sections that I couldn't read or didn't have enough time to read in the books. I reviewed them in Kansky. I reviewed them uh, in the Oxford Handbook. These were really good. So American Academy, if you have, if you have uh, time, start with it now. Guys, if you're in the middle of residency, if you just started residency or you're in the last year of your residency, these books are going to take you from a good ophthalmologist to a great freaking insane physician. I'm telling you, this is my opinion and I truly believe it and I know why I'm saying this. So this is the best advice that I could have given myself a couple of years back. Uh, Kansky is a good review. Um, and the Oxford handbook is amazing because it's basically, I understood this later on when I started reading through the academy books, the Oxford handbook is like a summary of all the high yield information found in the American Academy, but it's not enough to just study it on its own. And it barely has any illustrations and basically no pictures. So you need, you need a visual, like a visual reference. So Oxford handbook complements American Academy and Kansky. So uh, these were the main literature sources that I relied on during my studies. And then there was the question bank. So a Q bank is really important because it evaluates your knowledge before you reach a test. And you can't know how much you know unless someone tells you, hey, you did wrong. 
this is where a QBank comes in. Now, there are many out there, but I saw on the Academy webpage, on the American Academy webpage, that they recommend uh, a QBank called Off the Questions. So I looked into it. Off the Questions is literally one of the most popular, most downloaded, and amazing QBanks I've ever seen. It's very interactive. You can have it on your phone, your, your, your tablet, or your, your laptop, and it becomes addictive because you can manipulate and choose however, what kind of questions you want. High yield questions, new questions, questions that you've answered wrong that you want to get back to. And then it shows you like a chart of uh, which subjects you're good in, which subjects you need work in, and it evaluates your progress over time. So uh, the information that's in there is copy paste from the American Academy books. And when you answer a question, whether you answered right or wrong, it tells you why the wrong answer is right and why the wrong answers are wrong. And the best part of it as well is that there are community comment sections. So a comment section that you see other members, which are also ophthalmologists from all over the world, that give you tips, that comment about the question and provide mnemonics, which I found really helpful for the exam. So by far, off the questions is my go-to and my recommendation, and it helped cover that gap of the books that I had left in the American Academy and complemented all my literature knowledge for up to this exam. And by the time I reached the exam, I had been solving every single day between, like I'm, as I'm waiting for a patient to be dilated in the clinic, I was solving questions on the train, on a flight, on uh, <laughs> any free time, on weekends, every day I was solving questions nonstop. It becomes so addictive because you're training your brain. So by the time you reach the exam, you're so used to solving questions. Um, it's like, it's second nature. So it's it definitely my go-to. Now, this QBank, uh, some people, including myself, found at the beginning, okay, it might be a bit pricey, uh, but it is definitely worth it. So, for six months, it costs $300, and for a year, it costs maybe about $350. Be sure to check their website. But I was lucky that around the time that I uh, signed up for it, it was um, October, it was Halloween, so they had a sale going on. So basically, I paid for six months, but I got a year. So that's what the sale, the sale was. So check, check it out. And... Uh, you can use a link as well. I'm going to put below. I definitely endorse this pro this product. They're amazing. They're no words. So anyways, let's move forward now to the exam. The exam was online and 700 other people are sitting all around the world doing this exam with you. I don't know if they get the same exam as you do. Maybe probably. Now, how, how is it monitored? So, um, what they do is that they send you a link a week before to download a, basically a, pro, a program or a software on Google Chrome called uh, Exam Proctor or Proctor Exam, something like that. And what it does is that it allows the person sitting on the other side of the screen that is monitoring you to see you through your webcam and share the screen with you so they see what, what you're doing at all times. Before the exam starts, when you log in, they ask you to just like turn your laptop around, show them the room that you're in under under the table, and <laughs> um, they make sure that everything is set and they can hear you as well. You can't hear them and you can't talk to them. You can only type on a small chat box, so they uh, they can communicate with you through that if there's something to do. They are not doctors; they don't know anything about ophthalmology. They're here just to make sure that technically the exam is going as planned. You're allowed a paper and pen. You're allowed a snack and a drink, but you have to show the proctor before the exam starts what it is that you have. You can't just pull out uh, something new that they haven't seen. So the first part of the exam is multiple choice questions. Now, in multiple choice, you get two sections. You get the true or false section and then the single best answer. The true or false section, it's basically like this. They give you a subject, for example, cornea transplant. And then they ask you five true or false questions about that. And um, if you answer wrong, not only do you lose a point, but they deduct half a point off your score. So this is to encourage you not to guess. If you don't know it, press I don't know. In the single best answer section, basically if it's a straightforward questions about, I don't know, uh, prostaglandin and uh, agonist, 
do they increase outflow or yes or not like they have different like questions about it and you just choose the single best answer so here for single best answer if you answer wrong they do not deduct a point so you might as well just choose I got about 250 270 questions uh, between in the multiple choice section so true or false plus single best answer altogether and I think they give enough time I think I got about two and a half hours for that so it's probably I think I got 250 questions or, or maybe less I forgot honestly something around that in the ballpark so when this section is done uh, you can review the answers if you have enough time and uh, or you can just save and submit when that is done you have an hour break until the next section starts which is the clinical part now they send you two links so you log into the new link after an hour at the time that's assigned to you and you go through the same thing you share your screen you show them around the room all the same in the clinical section they give you eight cases so basically eight pictures with a history and each for each case there are five questions the thing is that these five questions are all related obviously to that case so if you get or if you're diagnosing something wrong the follow-up answers most likely are going to be wrong so take your time in this section in some cases they can just show you a picture and tell you what is the most probable diagnosis that fits this picture they won't they might not give you any history about the patient so it's a bit tricky but it's definitely not not like uh, they, they don't want you to fail they're just giving you some uh, a probable case that you can see in the clinic um the clinical part um is 60 percent of your grade so that's good and the multiple choice part is 40 percent of your grade now how do you answer the clinical part the clinical part they basically when they ask you a question they give you a small text box and you can type in it about 100 characters so no long answers and uh, when you submit and the test is done what is the passing grade you might ask so it is a curve and the passing grade really depends on how people like these other people are doing in this exam so this is basically how it is there's no just straight cut 50 percent passing grade so it all depends on the curve so in short just do your best and go for it um how was my experience through it well i was in the states at the time that i did this exam <laughs> so it started at 12 a.m and it finished at 5 a.m uh, I didn't feel that sleepy through the exam because you know the stress of it and you're excited and you're doing all these things so time definitely flew by uh, the strength of this exam is that um, the European board team they email you a lot before they provide you with all the details and information as well there was a QA and a uh, live stream a week before they send you a link to it they talk about all the details it's really beneficial it's really helpful did I think the questions were fair? I think a lot of the questions are basic knowledge, they're expected. They concentrate on as well topics that are life-threatening, like things that if you miss, the patient might be harmed severely. So it's topics that you should definitely be focusing on and knowing. Um, there were questions about optics and there were questions about as well um, genetics these were tricky so in, in some of these questions if something was autosomal recessive or dominant or how the inheritance pa pattern of that was and i was unsure i just pressed i don't know in the, in the true or false section and they even encourage you to choose i don't know if you don't know simply for you to not to lose points and not to waste time you don't want to linger too much on a question and yeah two weeks two weeks later they they send you an email and um like i said uh, i i I just got it yesterday so i'm so blessed and grateful thank you so much guys for all your love and support and thank you for listening to this uh, to this uh, video and i hope you found it helpful if you have any questions uh be sure to comment in the box down below or uh, direct message me on instagram on now i know and uh, if you guys are interested in any one-on-one -on -one sessions to get to know more about 
whether it is this European board uh, experience or if you want to know more about the process of moving to Sweden and my experience here, what this channel was built for, you're more than welcome as well. Wish you all the best, good luck on all your journeys, and I hope life is always many doors of success and achievements that's in front of your way. Peace, have a great weekend.